you know, those mental crash outs when you're catastrophizing and everything is going wrong. Well, I can definitely resonate with that feeling. I want you to know that you are not alone. I have spent years studying this because I wanted to understand what was going on in my own brain so that I could help you guys understand that too. So that life can feel a little bit less scary. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Nicole Vignola Show. If you're new here, please could you like, comment and subscribe. You'll be helping me make this channel grow. You'll be helping me reach those who need it the most that science and mental health care can be accessible to everybody. Guys, I'm gonna leave you with five simple steps to stop the spiral. So generally speaking, spiraling is an anxiety-driven behavior where you start to loop in on yourself on the thoughts. Now, not only that, you start to catastrophize, meaning that you add on. So you are now hypervigilant to threats, meaning that you go through life thinking that things are worse than they are. And for the most part, they could be bad, absolutely. But there are tools that can help you get out of the state so that you can problem solve. One of my favorite sayings is solutions, not problems, right? But to get to that point where we can problem solve, we need to get out of the spiral because it is very hard for us to try and solve the problem while we're in the vortex. When you're in the vortex, we all know that it doesn't really work. And that is because your brain is designed to run fight or flight from a situation, not listen, not reason. You need to remove yourself from the situation first before you can then rationalize, right? And this is the key problem, is that a lot of people try and make sense of the situation whilst they're in it, while their central nervous system is aroused, while they're in a sympathetic state of stress. Now, the problem is, is that this behavior starts to loop in on itself in an attempt to self-soothe the problem. So let's give you an example. The fear is, what will I say at that social event that's coming up for work? You are obliged to go to this work event and you're worried about what you're going to say to your colleagues. Now, the safety behavior is that you ruminate on what you're going to say to people and what people are going to say to you in an attempt to soothe the problem. So you start to overthink it. But then this makes you worry about what if you say something stupid, right? I think we can all resonate with that feeling. So you think more about what to say. And this is where the problem lies. Now, here's the problem is that you get this lucky escape. The event went well, but your brain has now learned that ruminating is what works. And so every time you have a social event, you start to get this loop of fear into your safety behavior, which is ruminating, and then the lucky escape, which is actually that worked. There's a really funny meme that says, 90% of my problems never happen, therefore ruminating works, therefore overthinking works, worrying works. And, and, and it's funny, I find it hilarious, but it, that is kind of how the brain works, is that we create this loop thinking that it's the ruminating that's actually helping us from the situation, and it's a learned behavior. And so you start to worry about the next event and that anxiety remains. So the amygdala stays active. The limbic system responsible for threat detecting stays active, especially when it comes to thinking about social events. Now, this can happen in many scenarios. That was a social anxiety example, which I think is applicable to a lot of people, but it can manifest itself in many other ways. Like, for example, you start to get triggered about something and then the rest of your day, you're in this anxious state and everything feels really heavy. If you can resonate with that, Put your hand up because I absolutely can. And I think I have a crash at at least, if I'm really being honest, probably once a week. But I do have high functioning anxiety. Cuts out the bag. And this is why I think it's really important for me to talk about this because I have been able to work through it and conquer it and do something about it. And these are the tools that I personally also rely on when it comes to these crash outs, these spirals. So the first thing you want to do is you want to notice that you're spiraling, okay? And even just naming it, saying, okay, I'm in a mental crash out right now is really helpful. Caveat, sometimes we exacerbate what we're feeling by saying I'm having a mental breakdown. And it is something that I work on with my clients all the time is a language that we use around how we're feeling. We wanna make sure that we're accurately naming it, but we're not embellishing it. So there's a fine line there. Now, the second thing you wanna do is you want to challenge those thoughts by asking questions about them. When you do that, you activate the prefrontal cortex. Now, here's the thing. Humans have something called metacognition, which is our ability to observe our thoughts. When you are trying to problem solve these thoughts, when you're in your own head, for lack of a better term, that is where the spiraling happens. When we can take ourselves out and think, okay, from a top-down perspective, what am I thinking right now? Are these thoughts true? Is this a helpful thought? And is there any evidence to support this thinking? Now, if you want to add another layer to that, writing these questions down and answering them can actually help snap you out of that thinking because you have to generate words. When we have to generate words, we use a much smaller part of the brain. When we're ruminatively thinking, we activate something called the default mode network, which resides in the entirety of the brain. It's quite a big network of brain areas. And what that means is that our thoughts are incohesive. They don't really 
really have a beginning, they don't really have an end, and they kind of just spiral. You know that feeling where they're just incohesive and they just kind of floating around all the time. When we have to think about words, when we have to generate words by writing them down, we activate a much smaller part of the brain responsible for generating these words and actively thinking about how we're feeling. So if you answer those three questions, is this a true thought? Is it a helpful thought? And is there any evidence to support this thinking? Then that will already snap you out of that default mode type thinking that is ruminative, that is linked to the limbic system, the amygdala responsible for threat detection. First thing you wanna do is you wanna take a big breath, okay? The physiological side, double inhale through the nose, pause at the top with a long exhale through the mouth. Let's do one together so you can see. You go. That is bottom-up regulation. So your body is dictating what state you're in. Top-down regulation can work in step number one and two, provided that you are able to snap yourself out of that ruminative thinking. So if step number one and two don't work, then you can add in the physiological sign. Step number four is that you can go and look outside. Our pupils have a direct line of communication with our stress system. So when we open our visual field, it's actually linked to the parasympathetic system, meaning calm. There's something calming about looking at an open space, especially if you are in nature. If you're able to get yourself outside, and look into an open panoramic view. You can do this from a window as well, provided that you're not looking out onto an ugly gray street. But even then, if you're just opening up your visual field, maybe you're in a high rise ideally, or you're in a situation where you can actually see the landscape, then that would be ideal because it's gonna help activate your parasympathetic system and just kind of broaden your perspective. We get very tunnel-like vision when we get in our own head and our own thoughts. And then tip number five is to call a friend or to speak to somebody about it. Now there's a caveat to this because we can go around in circles or we can ask the wrong advice and someone can give us the wrong advice. However, you will be able to discern whether you have the types of friends and family that you can call on. And the reason this works is because when we tell somebody our story, when we tell them how we feel, the shame seems to dissolve and cannot exist once we've spoken about it, especially if they respond with empathy. And the reason that is is because we're bookmarking from beginning to end how it is that we're feeling. So you're putting a narrative, a story to the feeling. It's the same reason as to why music feels so good. So if you don't have somebody to call, put on some music, listen to some songs that might help you because sometimes we hear a song and we resonate with exactly how it is that we're thinking or feeling because it gives us the opportunity to name what it is that we're going through. And we can also collectively resonate with other people, which gives us a sense of community. It gives us a sense of relief, knowing that there are other people in the world that go through the same thing. Now that is not in a way that's kind of reveling in other people's pain, but as humans, we're connected. We thrive on being able to know that we're not the only ones going through something. And in that collective experience, we start to try and help other people as well. And that's the beauty because you don't want to see other people going through pain. And so you start to soothe your own pain in that same mechanism. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Please send this to a friend. Please save it. Come back to it when you need it. I want you to know that you can absolutely gain control of your thoughts. And you can actually help yourself out of these spirals. I know this because I do this on a week weekly basis as I already told you so I'm here with you in solidarity to this feeling because it is something that I'm so passionate about speaking about because a lot of people don't realize that life doesn't need to be this scary. I created this channel and my Substack to provide a space for the overthinkers, the feelers and anyone who's just kind of caught in that in-between and needs a little bit of reassurance every now and again. Guys thank you so much.